Yeah. Right? And now, uh, the, what you are trying to do when you are uh, listening to me, you are trying to figure out what is the run of the hidden Markov model, given what observation or auditory perception you have. Right? So this is the, uh, the picture. You have a Markov chain that undergoes uh, uh, an evolution. And for each of uh, the states, you have observations O1, O2, O3, up to, say, OK. So you only have access to the observations. And you, what you want to do is to deduce uh, what were the states uh, that caused such observations. Right? Um, how would you solve this problem? How would you pick the, the Markov chain? How would you pick the run of the Markov chain? What would be the most natural way to do? To pick one which, to pick a run of Markov chain for which this sequence observations is what? Maximally likely, exactly. So, not all of uh, the observations are equally. Uh, uh, so, not all the sorry, not all the runs of the Markov chain are equally likely to produce such sequence of observations. So, besides having the states. Uh, and probabilities of transition and probability of the initial state, you have also probability, let's how did I call them in the notes so that I use the, uh, I call, uh, uh, emission, they are called emission probabilities. So E of I K is the probability Uh, if, uh, so probability uh, that uh, state uh, SI uh, caused observation uh, OK, right? So, we know probabilities of initial, for each state, we know what is the probability that Markov chain starts with that state. We know all the probabilities of transitioning from one state into the other. And for each state and each observation, you have probability that that state causes that observation. And your aim is, uh, given a sequence of observations, uh, what do you want to find a sequence of the states of the Markov chain for which the probability to produce such observations is as large as possible, is the largest. Uh, do you understand? Uh, any questions? Yes. Uh, so for the EIK, do it depends on the phonons that we collect and they compare the pattern with the. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So with the EIK, so do we uh, compare with the patterns, the actual voice, with the likelihood of the. Voice? So yes. So uh, for each phone, so what will be K? K is an observation. What in speech recognition is an observation is a particular value of the feature vector. So you. Uh, you, you split the speech in, uh, in uh, uh, slices. You, in the it's usually done in frequency domain. You find kind of filtered outputs with a, whole, with a filter bank. And the values of the filter bank are used as, uh, uh, as coordinates of a feature vector. And then for every phoneme, 
um, you find the, the probability to get such a feature, right? The, whatever you call observable. Yes? Uh, is this statistical analysis on the phonemes in the dictionary? Are those on neighboring ones or in the context of the whole word? Uh, it's uh, always on neighbor. Ah, okay, so that's a very good point. It's engineering. So it is not an ideal model. Because ideal model should do what you suggest. Uh, namely, it's not just the particular phoneme that determines the next, but obviously several previous phoneme impose probability what will be the next phoneme. Uh, unfortunately, too, this makes the analysis infinitely harder. So we make a simplifying assumption that it's a Markov chain, which means that it's completely memoryless. The probability of transition from a state depends only on that state and not on how it got to that state. And again, as I say, you see, this is the difference between math applied to physics and math applied to engineering. In physics, E equals mc squared, right? And that's it. Full stop, right? No, nothing to add. In engineering, uh, things are true. I mean, things are um, g g uh, correct for as long as I could for all practical purposes. Uh, I told you the dirty joke with practical purposes. OK, so you have a room, right? And here is Brad Pitt stark naked chained to the wall. <laughs> here is the door. And you have three girls. One is a mathematician, one is a, a physicist, and one is an engineer. And the rules of engagement are as follows. Every minute, you can traverse half of the distance remaining. <laughs> and the mathematician girl says, uh, forget it, I'll never, that's an infinite progression, I'll never get to Brad Pitt, right? <laughs> then the physicist girl comes in, right? And she knows about uh, infinite progressions, but she makes a few experiments and she notices that the distance she travels is shorter and shorter, so she gives up. Then the engineering girl comes in, and uh, the mathematician and the physicist, and stays forever, and mathematician and physicist the girls talk to each other and says, look, this girl is an engineer, she is done. Let's go inside, explain this to her so that the poor thing doesn't starve to death inside. <laughs> <laughs> so they go inside and tell, look, this is an infinite progression. You will never get to Brad Pitt. And she tells them, yeah, I know everything about infinite progressions, but I calculated that in about two hours I'll be close enough for all practical purposes. <laughs> <laughs> So, that's exactly what engineering is about. We don't care whether the model is matching reality like E equals mc squared. We just care whether it is good enough approximation to do the job, right? And this is crucial, and of course, like with any other algorithm, you prove correctness, you prove convergence, you prove this and that. It's all useless until you implement it and test it in practice, right? So, um, uh, so this. So, how would you solve the the algorithm? Now, notice is almost the same as this. Uh, we want to find out. We have a sequence of observations. Right, this is uh, this is O1, O2, up to ON, right? Well, I should call it OI1, we don't know the first of observations, so I2, OIN. And for each of these observations, you have M many <coughs> states, right? that could have caused this observation, 
with different probabilities. Uh, right? Here is uh, the, what did we have, the height state, right? The height observation. Oh, God, now I'll have to write all I, I. Uh, very good choice of, uh, uh, you know what I mean, so. <laughs> okay. And we have to find, at the end, which sequence of state, of states, was, is maximally likely to have caused these observations. What will be, and of course, this is solved by dynamic programming, right? And we will see what the complexity of the algorithm is. How would you solve this problem? What will be your sub problems? Yes. For each um, for each of the possible states in O by I, you would calculate um, the cost of that state plus you know the minimum, um, the maximum or the minimum of exactly. So what we are trying to find sub problems P I J yeah, will be the the uh, largest uh, or the maximal um, probability um, that, uh, uh, let's see, how should I spell it? How should I define it so that? Uh, I don't mess it up. Uh, we will define um, uh, L i j equals to the uh, largest probability of uh, some states Um, say uh, S uh, S uh, P one S P two up to S P I um, to cause observation. Observations uh, O I one or O I I, right? And such that uh, the last state. Is uh, uh, SJ yeah? right? So for every substring, sub string, or subsequence of observations, and for every state here, uh, we find the largest probability among all possible paths that end here with the state J to cause these observations. So the recursion is two-dimensional. I is the length of the initial segment. J is the J state at the end. So how would you... Um, how would you set up the recursion? What is uh, it's uh, by the way, uh, this is usually called rather than probabilities because they don't add up to one, they are called likelihoods. We will talk about this later. So, what is L i j equal to? 
So it has to be the largest probability. So what will be the operation here? Max, right, over all states, uh, say, uh, uh, Q between 1 and M. And then, what do I have here? L? I minus 1. And uh, what will be the state? Q. Q. Right? That's the largest likelihood at I minus 1 to end up with state of Q times probability of what transition? Exactly, from Q to uh, J, right? So this is the transition, but then the state J has to cause which, uh, which emission? Times E J, uh, what is it? Uh, e J or the observation? Let's write like this: observation I, right? And uh, what is L? Um, L uh, one J. So what is the uh, highest likelihood that uh, uh, the J state was picked? Well, that's just simplify J, doesn't it? It's constant, right? And voila, here you have uh, uh, how to find. And in order to be able to backtrack. Yeah, for the first one, then you have to multiply by E, J, uh, O1. Like the, the probability of, um, you need to use yeah. the observation. You need to look at the observation. Yeah, and the yeah. Yeah. Okay. At the state. You need to see what the probability is that the first observation caused the first Fermi. And multiply that by the likelihood of this. This is already. I mean, for L1. Yeah. For oh, yeah, 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 sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm, uh, on oh, autopilot, so O uh, J one O R one. Thank you very much, smart kitties. Okay. How fast is the? Oh, and of course now you can say you can also define a I to be the arg of max over Q and everything else. Namely, this is just for which Q this maximum was achieved, so that you can then backtrack to find the state. So how complex is this algorithm? So you see, you find optimal, just like in, the, in this uh, 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 problem, you simply find for each state, right, for each state you find the maximum likelihood to end up after I many, I, I minus one many uh, transitions in that state given the observed outcomes, and then you simply extend largest uh, likelihood for this will be largest likelihood up to here times probability of transition to the, that state times the probability to produce the observable outcome. So if you have altogether n many uh, observations and m many states, uh, then the time complexity T of uh, I uh, or T of uh, uh, N M, what would be the time complexity? B M squared N. Exactly. So it will be uh, 
it will be n times m squared. Why? Because you have to fill m many slots, but for each slot you have to see, you com have to compute probabilities to, uh, to have come from all of these states and pick the largest probability one, right, given the emission. And of course, this is compared to brute force, this is lightning fast. But this thing is used in mobile phones to decode convolutional codes for CDMA. So it operates at real time. And this turns out to be, it used to be slow, so there are um, different approximation algorithms for that. But uh, um, so the, the algorithm is used for mobile phones. It's used for speech recognition. Well, it used to be. You know what's the, for person who does algorithm, what's the most annoying thing? You see, we used to have to come up with clever solutions with Markov chains and whatnot. And we knew why they worked and how they worked. Nowadays, people just feed digital samples in some bloody neural network. <laughs> and no one has a clue why, but the bloody thing works. And so it's kind of the end of smart algorithms because, uh, <laughs> um, well, this is only half joking, right? It's amazing that absolutely no one has the slightest, slightest, slightest clue why neural nets work. There is no mathematical theory of neural nets to speak of. There are some esoteric results that are completely unrelated to how neural nets behave in practice. But lo and behold, uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a black box. So uh, in fact, Google has designed chips that are kind of computer architectures optimized for just doing uh, neural nets. OK, so this much about uh, Markov chains, uh, I don't think we will see them again. But please uh, read both PageRank and the Viterbi algorithm, just because it, it just appears everywhere. Right? Ryan, where is Ryan? You, uh, you had to deal with these kind of things in Commonwealth time, right? Okay. There you go. So it's about, uh, about if it's uh, in common uh, bank, I guarantee you it's only because it's useful, not because they like it. <laughs> OK. So next thing what we want to do is uh, something that is kind of slightly related to Google Pager. Uh, remember, so the next bit will be about voting algorithms, and I am going to just uh, slightly change uh, the ordering of the material compared to what's in the lecture notes, but we will cover everything uh, just in a slightly different order. <coughs> so this is, you know, very different types of problems can be construed as a voting problems. What is a voting problem? Well, you have votes for some elections, and you have to decide who the winner is. And it turns out that this is a fascinating and difficult problem, because as you will see uh, next time, one can prove an impossibility, famous arrows impossibility theorem um, uh, uh, that, uh, certain, that there is no kind of ideal voting uh, schema. Uh, but let me give you the one, one would say, why do I care about voting? Um, you see, for example, customer evaluation of products uh, can be seen as a voting problem. Why? Well, assume that you have a bunch of products. So here is product P1, 
P2 up to Pn, right? And then customers who bought that product evaluate how happy they are with the product, right? In a sense, this can be seen as voting on a whole bunch of elections in which for each product we have a list of candidates. What do you think? What are the candidates for each product? Satisfied and satisfied. Uh, it's a little bit more refined than satisfied by the satisfied. Exactly. Exactly. <coughs> so they are one star, two stars, three stars, four stars, five stars. Right? And lo and behold, right, you have here customers. And here you have products. And now, if a customer has voted on only one product, it's very dubious whether you should include this uh, vote in aggregation, because uh, it might be just, they say, the person who sells that product goes in and uh, uh, rank his own product. So we can assume that uh, uh, each customer has uh, evaluated uh, a few products, uh, right? For example, uh, to make this, if the products can be movies, uh, and these can be people who uh, rank, who evaluate movies, right? And lo and behold, uh, because my former students worked on that. Uh, there is a database called um, I, uh, DM, IMDb. IMDb that has a huge number of movies and uh, rank and uh, um, ratings from very large number of customers. And lo and behold, uh, <coughs> uh, on average, each customer ranks. Uh, uh, number of movies of, in the order of probably uh, tens or something like that, right? So each customer ranks several movies, uh, and every movie is ranked by several customers. Uh, and now you have to eva to uh, rank the movies to according to their popularity, or you want to decide what is the average number of stars for each product. Now, one simple way of doing it is uh, simply uh, do uh, how many uh, people voted for five stars, how many people voted for four, how many for three, for two, and then you can pick, for example, a number that is the largest, that got majority. That's called majority voting. The winner is one, a number that got uh, the largest number of voters, voted for that number, right? Uh, or, for example, if these are candidates for a city council, right, you would elect one, you would choose one that got the highest number of votes. But there is a serious problem with that, uh, when you just aggregate uh, votes by uh, counting the votes. What do you think, what's the problem with this method? Divisive things, so it gets lots of five stars and lots of one stars, then it gets under five That's stars. one problem that it can be, so maybe one can do weighted average number of stars times number of votes, right? Yeah, so if only one person votes, then it could be five stars. And now they're good at the top of the ranking, but it's hard to get a truthful. So exactly so. If it should somehow depend also on the number of votes, uh, but when it comes to um, reviewing products, there is a lot of fraudulent voting. I simply call all my friends and tell them to go to the website and give uh, um, my product. Uh, large number of five stars. Well, you might say, 
if a person votes only for one product, the system doesn't take him into account. Then knowing that, you can tell, go and vote whatever you please on a bunch of products and then go to my product and give five stars. So the problem of how to defeat this fraudulent voting, how to deal with that, happens to come, the algorithm happens to come from the Bible. <laughs> How about that, right? So, um, in fact, we couldn't help it. I, of course, I was absolutely blissfully ignorant of what's in the Bible, but uh, this student of mine, uh, interestingly enough, he knew even the quotation uh, uh, from the Bible, and we couldn't help it, but we included it uh, in the published paper, right? <laughs> so before I explain to you, I have to give you some biblical exegesis. <laughs> in the Bible, it is said at one point, do not judge, else you will be judged by the same measure. How about that? Right? Because if you judge people, you yourself can be judged by the way how you judge the others. Right? And that's the key of our algorithm for vote aggregation. So if you want to be good computer scientists, go read the Bible. <laughs> okay. How does our algorithm work? The idea is this. For every item on the list, I can calculate what fraction of the total votes on the list this fraction got. Say, one got 1 over 25, this got 3 over 25, this got 17 over 25 total votes, and whatever this way, right? Now you do the following trick. Each customer has voted. Now you can see how compliant his vote is with the community sentiment. So, because you would guess that community, by the wisdom of the crowd, should be good judge in total because large number of people should compensate for deviant behavior of minority, right? So now to each customer, you can associate some total of these fractions over all lists on which he voted. So for example, here if this guy voted for number 5, and there are 7 out of 25, the first will be 7 out of 25, uh, plus um, then he voted, for example, here for 3, and this is uh, uh, whatever, 16 over uh, 72. So you will get here plus 16 over 72, and so forth. Now, who will have a large, so to speak, trustworthiness rank? Which voters? People, so you see, this, again, uh, if you, quality of products, or how good a movie is. There is no truth how good a movie is. It's all a matter of opinion, right? So in such, and the same for products. So in such cases, we are not looking for an absolute truth. But we are looking for com uh, most accurate way of judging community sentiment. Because a movie is good if the community sentiment is such that it claims that the movie is good. So no absolute truth. So in this sense, this trustworthiness rank is to be interpreted not as really how honest the person is, but how compliant with being an average job is. And of course, nowadays, the society is involved in a direction when they want us all to be average Joes, right? with no deviation, no deviant uh, viewpoints, especially not politically, okay? <laughs> so now in the next stage, so it's the same voting, 
But now I can iterate. Now each customer's vote is not worth one, but it is worth its trustworthiness rank. So here I'll get each entry will get some total of trustworthiness ranks of the uh, of the people who voted for that option. Now I can repeat, I can iterate, and I can find new customer uh, trustworthiness according to these adjusted ranks, and I can keep uh, iterating until the calculation stabilizes. Uh, now, why does it stabilize? One can prove it with a very pretty proof, uh, and lo and behold, uh, we did it once because uh, we produced really pretty proof uses compactness and blah, 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 blah. And then the editor of the paper made us delete the proof. <laughs> and uh, so from there on, we never decided we will never ever prove anything, but just run practical experiment. And if it works, then it must be good. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but uh, in, on archive, I have a version for you for mathematicians. It's a very nice proof because Rather than being gradient uh, descent, it kind of goes, uh, kind of moving into the direction of the steepest descent actually moves kind of tangentially, uh, but it, pro it proves convergence. So uh, at the end, you can show that uh, when this will stabilize, it will stabilize when these customers' ranks are such that uh, when you recompute the ranks of items and return the trustworthiness, you get exactly the same value. So again, it will be of the form f of x equals to x, right? So, and a large number of algorithms, as you will see, rely on what's called fixed point uh, theorem, except here f, unlike page rank, here f will not be linear. Yes. How do you get the 16 over 72 again? Sorry? How do you get the 16 over 72? No, no, this is just a simple count. Uh, oh, okay. It means that three, 16 people out of 72 oh. voted for three. Oh, okay. Right? But then you do the trustworthiness, and then you, instead of one, each vote being worth one, instead of this, you will have a, the sum total of the trustworthiness. Yes? You mean over time, the um, customer's trustworthiness? Oh, no, 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 no. Careful. That's a good point. This is a single voting. Though the pattern of votes didn't change, the iteration is only iterative process to determine for this particular voting. So the distribution of votes is fixed. But the way how we find optimal this community sentiment is by an iterative procedure, but time has stopped, right? So this can be done by a single shot. Uh, of course, you and lo and behold, for your project, you can then try to incorporate uh, uh, when this is done over the time, and this tra 